article in here. Uh, we've got a full agenda, so Madam Clerk, if you could call the roll. Senator Alvarado. Here. Senator Harper Angel. Senator McDaniel. Senator McGarvey. Senator Schroeder. Here. Senator Southworth. Here. Senator Storm. Here. Senator Thayer. Here. Senator Wheeler. Here. Senator Nemes. Senator Mills. I'm here. Very good. And just a reminder, if we can all vote on our mic, turn our microphones on and vote, it'll help us uh, with our rec record keeping and also those that are on uh, KET. Uh, we're going to start with the first item on our agenda, which is uh, House Bill 618. It's uh, uh, a bill related to elections. It's Representative Bratcher's bill. And uh, we will allow Representative Bratcher, Chairman Bratcher to come to the to the table and if you can introduce yourself for the record and yeah. kevin bratcher state representative very good taylor, Tay taylor brown uh state board of elections general counsel very good uh, this board this uh this bill does have a committee substitute uh, if we could have a motion on the committee substitute second. we have a motion and a second on the committee substitute motion from uh representative thayer sec or or second from Senator Storm. Sorry, oh, I'm, I'm, the motion was Senator Storm, second by Senator Nemus. All in favor of adopting the committee sub, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The committee sub is before us. Chairman Bratcher. Thank you, sir. House Bill 618 puts uh, electronic poll books into statute. E-poll books have been around for several years, but as the state moves to centralized voting centers. They are more essential now than ever. These machines are not voting equipment. They don't mark or tabulate votes. What they do do is they let county clerks know in real time who has shown up to vote, ensuring that no one can then run to another location and vote twice. They also let precinct workers know which ballots to give to the voter, you know, like in Louisville, you have, gosh, you could have a dozen different ballots in a voting center. So it keeps that straight. Now, the committee sub, I'm not as familiar with that, but I will try to read some notes on that. Okay. It allows clerks to purchase electronic poll books that are certified by the state board beginning September 1st of this year. And chime in anytime you want, Mr. Uh, lawyer. <laughs> Although the clerk... <laughs> Although the clerks would have the standards by September 1st, they would not be allowed to use these newly certified machines until 2023 primary because there's a statewide vendor now that has the contract till we have a May motion. We have a motion from Senator Nemus, a second from Senator Wheeler. Is it okay? Would you like to add anything else? I go ahead, Taylor. Go ahead. <laughs> Sure, I, I can explain just a little bit more of the changes here uh, in the substitute. Um, section 2, we added a uh, change of the date to when the counties get their list of registered voters. So that will now occur before um, excused absentee voting starts. It was five days. That's not going to be enough time with uh, the expanded absentee voting that we have. We've also... Uh, amended section two to alter the language that would make sure that the state board gets to select the data format that is provided to the vendors. So if we end up with three, four vendors in the state, um, that way state board can push one set of data to the vendors instead of having to um, push out four different types of data. Um, as uh, Representative Bratcher said, we added the uh, certification date of September 1st um, the effective date of May 11th, 2023 for their use, those uh, requirements that are uh, now in the substitute are going to be promulgated by State Board of Elections. That's in there. And then finally, we amended the statute uh, that allows the county to select their own voting system to specifically um, make it clear that that also includes e-poll books. Very good. I know there's been a lot of work done on this substitute, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. Any questions or concerns? Senator Southworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first thing I want to ask about is on page nine, it says that the e-poll books certification requirements are going to be put together in regulation. 
and comparing that to current law where we set the certification requirements for voting systems in state law is there a reason why we're not doing the certification requirements in state law not no specific reason other than there hadn't been anything drafted that I had seen so administrative regulation was put in there can I ask one follow-up mr. chairman yes you may so at the same time that we're talking about we need to get to paper ballots because it's safer for a backup system is the exact same time frame when we've been talking about getting e poll books online and I'm glad you're here because in 2018 when we started this we had the paper backups and we had the paper backups in 2019 and you told me in 2020 we have gotten rid of the paper backups now and the clerks are telling me that as well so is there ever a time in these certification requirements where we're ever going to have a paper backup for who all signed up to vote or is this since these can touch the internet e-poll books are entirely online is there going to be a way that we can have a backup system so Yes, Senator. The, the lists that are mentioned there, they will be able to be printed out if the county needs them or desires to print them out. They'll be part of the VRS system. So, yes, a paper, a paper backup is possible. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Alvarado? Aye. <clears throat> Senator Harper Angel? Aye. Said aye. Yes. It's, it's, Senator McDaniel? Aye. Thank you. Senator McGarvey? Aye. Senator Nemes? Aye. Senator Schroeder? Aye. Senator Southworth? Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you may. Mr. Chairman, I've been long standing opponent of voting systems that are online. So moving the definition of e poll book outside the voting system does not really solve the fact that they are totally online. Senator Storm? Aye. Senator Thayer? Aye. Senator Wheeler? Aye. Senator Mills? I vote aye. House Bill 618, as amended by committee sub, uh, passes with favorable expression 10 to 1. And we'll move on to the Senate floor. Thank you, Chairman sir. Bratcher, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Next on the agenda is House Bill 314. This is a bill brought to us by Representative Nemus. And he may have a guest as well. If you can introduce yourself for the record and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jason Emus, represent the 33rd District, which is in Jefferson, Oldham, and Shelby counties. With okay. me is. We have we do have a uh, committee Kemper. sub, which is labeled uh, Committee Sub Two. If we can have a motion to get that before us. We have a motion from Senator Alvarado. We have a second. Second from Senator Nemus. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Julie Rocky Adams is also here if any questions need to be asked that she can answer. Um, so this bill does effectively eight things. Uh, most of them are non-controversial. I'll, I'll knock them out real quickly. Um, right now, there is an oversight and audit committee with the Louisville Metro Council. They have the right, this is on page five, they have the right to subpoena officers and employees. It's unclear whether they have the right to subpoena former officers and employees, and so we're making that, that clear that they do. So if you know, an, an officer leaves the employment of uh, Louisville Metro, they can still uh, be called back to answer questions when that's necessary. And that's not a controversial measure. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, not require, uh, it's on um, page 13, not re require county attorney approval to uh, file an ordinance. Uh, right now, in order to file an ordinance, you have to get pre-approval from the county attorney. That will be akin to us having to get approval from the attorney general. Uh, so we're removing that. Now it's going to be advisory. The county attorney I've spoken with and uh, um, the members of council that's uh, uh, agree with that. That's not a controversial um, provision either. Uh, the third provision is on page six. It goes from a three-term limit to a two-term limit in, uh, for the Louisville mayor. Um, the fourth uh, um, thing that it does on page 14, and that is it clarifies that the mayor will make appointments uh, to which the legislature must approve if it's provided by statute may have 60 days to do that and then it clarifies that the legislature the council will make a legislative appointment so that's just a, another housekeeping measure uh, the fifth thing it does is it says that right now if there's a if there's a an effort to remove a council person or mayor 
then the they they put together what's called a charging committee. There's a, a five person, it could be five to ten, but it's been five persons in the past. A five person charging committee. And if you're if you serve on that charging committee, you're not allowed to vote on and in the committee of the whole. And so that takes away five votes and makes it virtually impossible to remove a council person or a mayor from office. Not intended when the when this was drafted. Again, this was requested uh, for by the um, council persons, and and I've uh, heard no no um, uh, no pushback on that. The sixth thing it does is in Louisville, as uh, most people know, there's Old Louisville, which is the Urban Services District, and they pay a uh, different tax rate than people outside the Urban Services District for things uh, like garbage and other things that services that are provided inside the district that aren't provided outside the district. The fear or the thought is um, that some of the, the money in the general fund supplements wrongly supplements services that are only provided inside the um, urban services district. So we're trying to get an annual audit there to see if it's true. If it's not true, then we, we need to stop that. Uh, that um, it would be a myth that we need to, we need to push back. And if it is true, it needs to stop. Uh, because you shouldn't be paying taxes for services that, that you're not even eligible to receive. Uh, that's the sixth thing. Um, two things that it does that this is the, the portion that I think the mayor of Louisville is here to talk about is it allows annexations and incorporations. So over 20 years ago, uh, Louisville was merged uh, by a vote of the, of the community, and we had a 12-year hiatus on annexations. And what this does is it removes um, the hiatus on annexations with 66% of the of the voters of the people who are going to be annexed uh, it's important to note that that does not apply doesn't go into effect until july of 2024 that will have more significance in just a second when i finish my remarks but but just remember that there can be no uh this annexation provision does not apply um until july of 2024 one thing that my friends on the other side will say is there have been annexation requests that have been approved that is true They've been very small, and there's a chilling effect because they know that any significant annexations will not be approved, and so they've not they've not made those types of requests. Um, the incorporation provision, it, what what happens here? I want to say, I do not support, nor does the other representatives, nor does Senator Julie Rocky Adams support a proliferation of very small cities in Jefferson County. We have 81; two are defunct, so we have 79. That sounds like a lot. It is a lot. Some of them are very small. But I want to say to the committee that it's about one per every 10,000 Louisville residents. And in Kentucky, the cities in Kentucky are about one per every 10,000 residents. So while it seems like we have a, a lot, and we do, on per capita basis, we have about the same as we have throughout the Commonwealth of Kentucky. But what this bill would do was it would say you have to have over 6,000 people. That's not true in the rest of the Commonwealth. I think it's over 300 households. You have to have over 6,000 people, and 66% of those people have to agree to uh, to incorporate now the, my friends on the other side are going to say that uh, that hurts louisville it takes money from louisville and it it takes no money from louisville it does take the urban excuse me the uh, insurance premium tax and gives it to the newly incorporated area which is still in louisville so it enables middletown or douglas hills or if fern creek were to people have heard of fern creek that's a big area in louisville they're not they do not um, have a city it would enable them to keep that money in their communities and that benefits the entire city as well. And how? For example, if you're in Middletown or if you're in J-Town, you have an LMPD officer per approximately every 200 people. If you're elsewhere in the community, you have it per every 1,800 people. And in one area, it's every 2,200 people. So the east end is for every 2,200 people. And the west end, it's 200 people. This bill doesn't change that. This bill does not say you have to make that more equitable. That's not my intent. What this bill does, Senator McDaniel, is it says that the people of Fern Creek, if they want to pay more and 66% of them come together, they can then incorporate and get their own police department or their own whatever services that, all the, that, that our great cities in the Commonwealth and the Jefferson County provide. Um, it is, uh, shouldn't be lost on anyone looking at this question. Um, I represent the East End. I'm from the South End. Uh, my favorite person in the Senate represents the South End. Um, all the cities in Louisville are in the East End. We're very wealthy. We take care of our own business, right? The people in the South End have not been given that opportunity. And, that, and that's a working man community. Not that they're not in the East End, the West End, everybody, you know, they are. But the South End is dominated by middle class working, working folk. And they should have the same rights to protect themselves, whether it's roads or whatever, that we have in the East End. 
if I can cut you off there and allow the other side, have you made? Have you, There's one more big point. Okay, now, I'll ahead. just make the big point. So, and again, that that also doesn't apply until July of 2024. Um, we put a group together to study these issues. So we'll take the Louisville stuff off and hopefully the Republicans and the Democrats and everybody else in Louisville can come together with a package in a couple of years to the General Assembly to improve merger. So there's a 15 person group there. It's the mayor, the, city, the, the Jefferson County League of Cities chairperson, uh, three GLI appointees, three appointees from the Senate, three appointees from the House, three appointees from local uh, council. Um, and the, the fire chief, uh, an appointee from the fire chiefs, to look at these issues to bring um, a holistic package to the General Assembly in 2024. That report it will be due to the General Assembly in September of 2023. So that's that's the bill, and, and I'll uh, do it as, uh, as you suggest. <laughs> let me have uh, Representative Fleming, uh, let me bring up the mayor and councilman, and then I'll let y'all talk about anything after they, if that's fine. Thank mayor, you. if you want to come forward. Thank you for being here today. We have a very tight agenda. I know we've spoken, so if you can be concise. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate the opportunity to present here today. I'm Greg Fisher, the mayor of Louisville. Appreciate you all allowing me to speak today about House Bill 314, which is of enormous concern and consequences for the city of Louisville, our residences, businesses, and Metro Council. Now, for those who weren't here when Louisville residents discussed, debated, and voted for merger in the late 1990s and 2000, just a brief review. First, there was significant local input. After various prior attempts over the years, the final and successful merger process involved bringing people to the table from across the aisles and across the county. This included the business community, federal and state partners, community and neighborhood leaders, public safety personnel, local officials, and many more. The legislature was obviously involved as well, voting in 2000 to allow a merger referendum to be put on the Jefferson County ballot. And of course, most importantly, there was the vote by the citizens of Jefferson County that November to allow implementation of merger to begin in 2003. And on a note directly relevant to this bill, residents that desired more services can use the service district provision of Metro Government Merger Law 67C to make that happen. They don't need to form a new city. So let's flash forward to today. Merger catapulted Louisville onto the national radar screen, surpassing Charlotte, Washington, D.C., Portland, Cleveland, Denver, Raleigh, and Kansas City in population. And it transformed the view of my city as a smaller town into a modern growing metropolitan area and the economic engine for the Commonwealth. So by streamlining government services, merger has made Louisville more competitive in business recruitment, a place that is easy to do business with. And Louisville today is viewed as an award-winning, business-friendly site by site selection consultants and C-suite decision makers in part because we have a one-stop shop for services and they don't have to worry about intergovernmental squabbling among multiple different governments. Our results are strong. Since 2014, our city has experienced more than $21 billion in capital investments in every part of our community, from Colonial Gardens in South Louisville to downtown New Lou, the incredible new public library in the east, and the just announced plans for a new hospital in West Louisville. We've added more than 83,000 jobs and seen a faster economic recovery from COVID-19 than most of our peer cities in the balance of the Commonwealth. House Bill 314 seriously jeopardizes that success, and that's why I'm here today. First is the issue of general government services. If HB 314 passes, it could lead to a proliferation of new small governments, which beyond the confusion and frustration for businesses looking to locate or grow in Louisville, potentially could leave a $50 million hole in revenue to cover all the services that every resident of Louisville relies on. 911 services, public safety, infrastructure maintenance, libraries, codes and regulations, correction parks, and more. It represents almost 9% of the entire city's general fund. Next is the issue of federal funds. Let's remember, too, the positive impact that the population increase we realized from mergers had. One example. Louisville's larger population of over 500,000 people allowed residents to benefit from an additional $134 million than we would have had without merger because of population thresholds in the CARES Act. Louisville's population is 783,000 people. 387,000 people live in unincorporated areas. So you can see that our population could be roughly cut in half if the entirety of this bill went into effect. Third, and most importantly, HB 314 would override a decision approved by the voters of this community in 2000 after a long community-centered process. Make no mistake, this bill will unwind a critical component of merger, and it will do so without that same level of community involvement, study, and discussion that led to the passage of merger nearly two decades ago. 
And last is the impact of this bill, making Louisville a more difficult place to do business with. I've spent the last several weeks calling the CEOs of major companies in our city and other business leaders and developers. Overwhelmingly, they said they were not aware of HB 314 and have real concerns about the lack of study into how unwinding merger would impact their companies in their city. So what happens to occupational taxes if a major employer, like an appliance park or a truck or car plant, is annexed? How about the developer that now has to work with an additional layer of government? All this should be thought through. Government should be easier to do business with, not more complex. So how do we move forward? I applaud uh, Representative Nemus and the bill's amendment that creates the concept of a task force to study how merger can be improved. Louisville has been nationally recognized by What Works Cities as one of the only two governments in the country at the top level of using data to run efficient government, so we are all about improvement. The first rule of problem solving is to identify the problem first, the areas for improvement, before you arrive at solutions. So we need to hit the pause button. Let a task force get to work to identify all the areas for improvement, then introduce the legislative complement. We can always make something better and find ways to improve, and our merged government is no different. Louisville residents, along with the new mayor and Metro Council that will come in January 23, should have the opportunity to study the full impact of the legislation before it is changed, not after. Studying it after you pass a law to change, as the amendment is written, is putting the cart before the horse. And what I am for is making the bill the best it can be, and that requires broad local input. So passing merger in Louisville was a monumental achievement and the envy of many city and county governments across the country. Merger has been a success for Louisville, attracting businesses, streamlining services, and saving taxpayers money. So let's not go backwards. Let's make Louisville even stronger the right way with a bill driven by broad study and community input with the General Assembly acting at the right time to codify the improvements. Thank you for your time. Very good. Councilman, if you have one minute of comments or so, please be, be brief. I'll try to be brief. I'm, Thank you. I'm the Metro Councilman for District 9. My name is Bill Hollander. I chair the Budget Committee. District 9 includes every kind of, of uh, area that you have in Jefferson County, Urban Service District, uh, unincorporated areas, and suburban cities. When Jefferson County voters chose a consolidated local government in 2000, Louisville Metro's population, the population of Jefferson County, less suburban cities, and that's the commonly used measure, it leaped. We currently rank as the 29th largest city in the United States, which, as the mayor said, has led to increased federal revenue, among other benefits. Creation of new cities and expansion of existing cities without any control by Metro Council threatens that position. I've recently heard talk last week from a member of the Jefferson County League of Cities of a brand new 105,000 population city within Jefferson County. If that happened, Louisville would immediately drop to the 38th largest city in the, count, in the country, and our position as a city of more than 500,000 people would immediately be threatened. No consolidated or merged city government in the United States, and look at Indianapolis, look at Nashville, look at Lexington, no consolidated or merged government in the United States is shrinking because new cities are being formed within their boundaries. It is unheard of, and it is unnecessary to provide new services to unincorporated areas. Current law, and I'll, I'm, I'm wrapping up, current law provides for service districts to be established to supply services sought by residents in unincorporated areas. It's KRS 67C-145. KRS 67C-145 provides for service districts specifically to local metro. It, um, it, it's been in the law since the beginning. It was widely discussed in a 2015 Metro Council Committee chaired by a Republican and vice chaired by me. The process starts with a petition to Metro Council and no one, no one has ever filed such a petition asking for the creation of a service district. And that's despite encouragement from council members. Service districts can provide the services that people want without taking insurance premium taxes and other revenue from Louisville Metro. Revenue we use for a variety of countywide services. Services like corrections and the health department and our Louisville Free Public Library and many more. We should listen to people like Denise Bentley, a former council person from Louisville who, who left the council to join the Fletcher administration who recently told WHAS 
that creating more cities would further disparities that West Louisville and poorer communities face. A broad majority of Metro Council from all over the county welcome a task force to study this issue. We hope it is broadly inclusive of everyone in the county. And I think it should include people from the Urban Services District, areas that can be hurt by taking tax revenue for new cities. Fundamentally changing law, law, however, breaking the model the voters approved and the model used in other consolidated cities across the entire United States before the task force is even formed or begins its work reminds me of the Old West saying to shoot first and ask questions later. Thank you, Thank sir. You. We will have a couple questions. Senator Schroeder has a question. Representative Nemus, if you want to come to the table as well. Thank you, and I'll start talking, Mr. Chair, as Representative Nemus comes back to the table. Uh, Representative, thank you for stopping by, talking to me about this bill. Uh, that goes along with me. I certainly appreciate it. I want to ask, it's kind of an ancillary point I think that you made, but one that I wasn't expecting to see today. On page six, you talked about uh, just the change of three to two consecutive terms. Is that... Is that something that this body is typically taking up with other cities? It strikes me um, as a little uh, outside of our purview, I guess, that we would dictate a city's uh, term limits. Well, it has to. The General Assembly sets the term limits. There's no other way to set it. And so if it were to change, it would have to be the General Assembly that do that. The city council or the, the city mayor is not, um, is not empowered to change the term limits. So it, would, it has to be a change in the statute, which also leads me to, to another quick point I want to make, and that is what, what this bill does on incorporation, and my, my friends on the other side disagree with that question, I get it. Um, what this bill does is it returns the question to Louisville. Right now, if the people of Fern Creek where Representative Bratcher lives, they want to have their own police protection. If they want that, they're not allowed to. Why? Because Frankfurt stops it. What this bill does is it says the people of Fern Creek can make that decision. So it returns it to the local level. Uh, Senator Wheeler has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is for any of the members sitting there today. And uh, actually, you know, although I guess I'm known up here as a man of the mountains, I was actually born in Louisville. Uh, my dad was a, a student at the University of Louisville Medical School, so it's a city I have great uh, love for and uh, enjoy visiting. Um, one, can a service district create a police department? It's certainly contract for police services, yes. Okay, but can they create a police department? The statute says that they can do everything that a consolidated government can do, any services provided by a consolidated okay. local government. Well, you know, you may, I may continue, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you may, quickly. You know, you made the comment earlier that this is shooting first and asking, question later, asking questions later. I think the problems are the shootings. I mean, there were six shootings in Louisville last weekend, and it amazes me that you all come down here today and, and essentially um, – wonder why uh, citizens on the south end uh, are, are, are perhaps worried and not feeling safe within the confines of metro louisville um you know we, we've seen not only has louisville been an engine for growth which I, I will agree it has been to an extent but it's also been an engine for crime in the commonwealth of kentucky due in my opinion to a lot of poor leadership and poor decisions which essentially let criminals run wild over the last two years down there and you know this bill seems like it has a lot of protections in the sense that 66 percent of the people within a voting district would have to want to leave the metro area do you not feel that if two-thirds of the people within an area are feeling unserved or at least unlistened to by the city of louisville that 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 they not uh, they, they should be able to forge their own path in such a way that they feel that their folks are protected and are not just being exploited Thank you, Senator. Uh, what we do believe on top of that is that people should have a right to be heard first. A large co a corporation like a Ford or a General Electric should understand the impact on their companies, whether it's a, a rise in taxes or other issues associated with that, before the bill is put into impact. So that's why the study is so important to do that first. Right. Senator, I, I want to answer your question. I'm Certainly, thinking. Representative Davis. I, I agree with, with uh, my friend, the mayor here, on, on that the businesses should be heard. No doubt about that. He's reached out to them. I've reached out to them. They've called me and said, the mayor's called me. I'm supposed to call you, so I'm calling. Some of them have done that. GLI is neutral on the bill. GLI has three, G, GLI is the local chambers, you know, have three appointments to this group. So I agree that the businesses need to be heard. Incorporation and annexation doesn't go into effect for two years. The question about the police protection. 
why should Fern Creek or Valley Station have to beg Metro Council to do something that they should already be doing? They are not policing our areas. If you see an LMPD officer in my neck of the woods, you have seen a unicorn. It's one per every over 2,000 people. Other areas, it's one for every 200. We have, this bill doesn't address that. It leaves it at that. It says, let us pay more to protect ourselves. That's what this does. Why should they go beg the Metro Council to allow them to do something that Metro Council should already be doing? Let them take care of themselves. Okay, Senator McGarvey has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First question is for, for Mayor Fisher. Mayor, have you talked to any of, the, of our employers or any of our businesses about this and what are their thoughts on it? Yes, absolutely, I have. Uh, uniformly, what they're surprised at is they didn't know about the bill and they have a desire to have an input uh, to the bill and it could impact some very large employers of ours we've had great economic success we're growing in our city so employers need to be involved up front there's there could be ways to improve this bill and i, I applaud Mr. Uh, representative nemus for wanting to improve merge city county government we're all about that as well we're just saying let's study that first understand the implications it could be negative on businesses on developers and make sure those are removed before any improvements are made to this bill Thank you. I think that's an important point. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for Representative Nemus. Yes. Um, you were talking about public safety, Representative Nemus. I know that the Kentucky State Police is several hundred troopers short right now, haven't been funded fully in the budget for years. So would you have a problem with taking this statewide so that any community in the state could form a city anytime they want to in any county without having the county judge or the fiscal court have veto power so that they, could, they too can feel safe? Yeah, I, th I, think I think a city in Pulaski County, just to choose one, uh, an area in Pulaski County can incorporate. Um, they're allowed to do that. They're allowed to annex. They annex quite quite frequently. In Louisville, they're not allowed to do that. So this returns the question in Louisville like it's already in Pulaski County. So you have no problem supplying the same provisions of this bill to the entire state? This this bill applies the entire state's laws to Louisville. So it's already getting So we happened. can do an amendment that specifically all, everything, that every other county in the state will be just like Louisville will be treated in this? No, I don't, I don't think anybody, I, 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 it's kind of a gotcha question. I don't think anybody. It's, it's no, just a yes or no. Well, let me, it's not a yes or no. It, provides, it, it requires context. I don't think anybody in the city of Louisville would want that. And I don't think anybody outside of the city of Louisville want, would want that to be exactly. I do like it how you're speaking for the entire state right now. Well, you've asked me a question. I'm answering your question. You said, you said no one in the city of Louisville or no one. I, I just, I said, if this I don't is good, think, if this is good, okay, guys, if I can get, answer the question. Let's, let's yeah, get I, a question okay. answered. Yeah, we have, on the bill. we have. We have a motion from Senator Thayer, a second from Senator Wheeler. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Senator Alvarado? Aye. Senator Harper Angel? Aye. Senator McDaniel? Aye. Senator McGarvey? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Explain my no vote. Yes, you may. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you just saw a debate get cut off on this, unfortunately. Um, let's talk about what's going on here. There are 17 state representatives who have their districts wholly within Jefferson County. 14 of them voted against this bill. There are six state senators who have their districts wholly within Jefferson County. Five of them are going to vote against this bill. The Metro Council does not support this bill. The mayor of Louisville does not support this bill. The people of Louisville voted to have merger. Merger means coming together as a community in which we are all together as a community. We have Frankfurt now coming up here and dictating how the governing structure of the city of Louisville is to operate without even studying it or knowing what the impact is going to be. You've heard us for a while now. I pushed last year, let's actually have a task force that studies these issues. It's been 20 years since the implementation of merger. I think it's appropriate to have a conversation of what is working and what isn't working all over our community for merger and come up with real recommendations, hard conversations. And then if we have to change it in statute because this is a creature of statute, let's do it. But this is not the way to handle this. And if it is, I think we should, if we talked about just now, maybe see some amendments that do apply this to the rest of the state, to your communities as well. Thank you. Senator Nemes. I'd like to explain my I vote. Yes, you may. I was going to ask uh, my good friend, Mayor Fisher, and uh, the uh, Representative Nemus with his uh, knowledge of the South and the East End, but I'll turn this into a statement. 
the uh, it was stated that uh, in two, in 1998 2003 we voted for a merger. I was I lived in Jefferson County at the time, and we did. But as we all know, we vote for things and we come back and we change and adjust our legislation as needed. Why shouldn't the people of Louisville have a chance to change their opinion of what they voted on before? Why not vote again? It takes 66% of the people to do that to annex or, or well, not annex, but incorporate. And uh, the annexation, they already have that right in the East End. The South End does not have that right. They can only incorporate. Why should they not have that right? 66% of the people have to vote on that. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to be a problem. Uh, and if they're not happy, then it should happen. So I just don't understand the problem with that. It, it's, uh, it's just discriminating against the rich and the poor if they don't have the, right, the same rights as, as the other. And, and it's, uh, it is the South End working people, Valley Station, Fairdale, Okalona, Fern Creek that don't have that right. And I do think, I'm not sure, that I'm probably the only state senator that has lived in the South End. Most of the other ones live in the East End or the Central Part that ha may have part of the South End as their district, but did not actually grow up there. So I vote aye. Senator Schroeder? Aye. Senator Southworth? Explain my pass vote, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Yes, you may. Mr. Chairman, I had a question that didn't get to get an asked or answered. And I feel like I'm reading page 10 of the bill correctly when it says that we have to have approval of the legislative council in order to do any of these. To me, it looked like language that would possibly be everybody's getting together on the same page. And last year around this time, I said, why don't the Jefferson County Caucus, Jefferson County Caucus get together and figure out what they want to do and let us know. And guess what? Now I'm a member of the Jefferson County Caucus and I haven't heard a thing about this until two weeks ago. I went to a town hall and got, this is a big issue and I'm ready to dive in. But um, it doesn't work to shut down all the rest of the questions when we are right in the middle of what turns into being an out of control fireworks show. So I may vote yes on the floor, but right now I'm voting pass because this has not been properly vetted and it needs to get a little better discussion before we move forward on something that I think is pretty big. Senator Storm? Aye. Senator Thayer? Aye. Senator Wheeler? Mr. Chairman, explain my aye vote. Yes, you may. And I mean, I frankly think it's unfortunate that we've gotten here. Uh, many of our great cities in the United States, which were previously economic drivers, have been drivers now of crime and death. And I think we've seen some of the same issues in Louisville. And it's, it, it, it breaks my heart to see that in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, especially when areas, working class areas of the city, feel like they just aren't getting the services that they're paying for. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, we've seen this not only in Louisville, we've seen it in large cities all across the United States. So, I mean, to me, it's a question of well, maybe they've said we've not seen this in other cities. Maybe we do need to see this in other cities because it's apparent to me that many of these large cities, uh, based on Representative Nemes' testimony here before this committee, clearly aren't serving the needs of their citizens. And if two-thirds of the citizens in a particular area feel that way, then I think it's our obligation as the General Assembly to give them options to protect themselves. So, Representative Nemes, I proudly support this bill. Thank you very much, sir. Senator Mills. I vote aye. Uh, House Bill 314 as amended passes 8 to 2 and 1 pass and shall move on to the Senate. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next on the agenda is uh, House Bill 239. It's a bill brought to us by Representative Koenig. Representative Koenig, if you can introduce yourself for the record, and we've got about uh, five to seven minutes, and we also have some folks behind you that wish to testify from the Constables Association. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Adam Koenig, State Representative, 69th District. Brianna. Brianna Carroll, Director of Public Affairs for the Kentucky League of Cities. Chair. As we get our PowerPoint up, Chief, introduce yourself. That shows. 
Well, I guess good afternoon at this point in time of day. Uh, my name is William Hunt. I'm the Chief of Police in Somerset, Kentucky, and I'm serving as the first Vice President of the Kentucky Association of Chief of Police. Very good. Representative Caney. We have um, Shelly Hampton with Keiko back here for moral support and answer any questions, and Commissioner Jillick from DOCJT available to answer any training questions. Commissioner, good to have you. Thank you. House Bill 239 is a measure that will make our communities and constituents safer. This bill ensures that people who use peace officer powers, those who make arrests and traffic stops and respond to crime scenes, are trained law enforcement personnel. Some people may not realize it, but constables can do all of those things even though they've never received one hour of law enforcement training. These elected office holders often carry a gun and badge and exercise the same powers as state trooper, sheriff's deputy, or city police officer. The key distinction is that we require police officers, state troopers, and deputies in this state to go through exhaustive training. A 20-week course of the Department of Criminal Justice training covers patrol procedures, defensive tactics, criminal law, tactical response, traffic investigations, and many other topics an officer needs to know to protect and serve the Commonwealth. There are currently more than 500 constables in Kentucky, and only two have attained the same peace officer professional standards or POP certification. House Bill 239 addresses this situation. I want to stress that this bill does not remove the office of constable from the Kentucky Constitution. It's important to point out that the Constitution only names the position, jurisdiction, and qualifications for constable. Their peace officer powers are statutorily granted. This legislation does not impact current constables or their deputies because it grandfathers current constables in. I'm going to repeat that. This legislation grandfathers current constables and their deputies in, allowing them to use peace officer powers for as long as they serve. House Bill 239 has a delayed effective date of January 1, 2023, after the next election cycle. House Bill 239 would not stop newly elected constables who are not POP certified from serving their communities. They'll still be able to serve legal process, assist with child support actions, serve subpoenas, direct traffic, provide funeral escorts, and perform other community services. House Bill 239 ensures that a constable has not been through the same training and certification process that we, the legislature, expect of other law enforcement officers cannot infringe on another person's civil liberties, cannot make a traffic stop, make an arrest, or file criminal charges. House Bill 239 will help constables get that required peace officer training. And the bill specifies that constables can apply to any Kentucky Law Enforcement Council certified basic training course. And additionally, the bill requires the Department of Criminal Justice training to accept at least one qualified constable in each training class. DOCJT holds about 9 to 10 classes a year, with 30 recruits in each class. The provision to accept one qualified constable per DOC training class was added despite a wait of several months for newly hired police officers and sheriff's deputies. I know time is short, and I will cut off my comments right there and allow uh, Brianna to make a few comments, if she would. Good afternoon. We are... Um, thankful that you've allowed us to hear this bill today. Um, several other states, actually half of the states, have addressed the uh, antiquated office of constable. Sixteen states have eliminated the office. Seven have allowed municipalities to address it. Six other states, including Arizona, Texas, Maryland, South Carolina, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, have adopted the similar, me similar measures of what we're actually proposing today. Those states require constables to receive police training in order to use their law enforcement powers. House Bill 239 is a result of several years, um, I think Representative Koenig uh, addressed that, 13 years of um, discussions and drafts, and we have met with the Constables Association and other constables several times throughout um, the course of, of uh, discussions. Um, this measure has a delayed effective date of January 1, 2023 to ensure that uh, this does not impact anyone who's currently in office. This will ensure that the changes only impact untrained constables who begin their first term after the 2022 election. Certified constables will be allowed to utilize their blue lights on their vehicles without training approval. 
from the fiscal court as long as they maintain their certification and do not abuse that authorization. Additionally, House Bill 239 provides the constables a path to receive certification. The bill specifies that the constables can apply to any Kentucky Law Enforcement Council certified basic training course, which it would include um, any that are certified, and the bill requires the Department of Criminal Justice training to accept at least one constable in each training class. DOCJT does average at least tr 10 training classes per year with 30 recruits per class. Uh, DOCJT also knows of only one constable who's applied to the academy over the past five years, and additionally, only 13 constables have applied for in-service classes. The provision to accept one qualified constable per DOC training class was added despite a wait of several months for newly hired police officers and sheriff's deputies. We have had several conversations with the constables and the Constables Association over the past several years, and we want to stress that we know and acknowledge that not all constables are bad. Bad. and not all constables exercise police officer powers. Um, we also know that those uh, who will speak against the bill will stress that uh, there are bad actors in law enforcement, and we know that. In 2019, the legislature passed House Bill 191 to strengthen or to create the decertification process for troubled police officers. Last year, you strengthened that measure by passing Senate Bill 80. Both of those measures were also championed by KLC. House Bill 239 addresses those constables who peace of, whose peace officer powers are statutorily granted, not constitutionally, and this bill will make our, con our community safer, and we ask for your support. I will turn it over to Chief Hunt from Somerset. Yes, sir. Well, thank the committee for uh, hearing us this morning on this matter. It's a very important matter, and the primary fact is that we're wanting to look at uh, the issue of required law enforcement training for constables in our commonwealth. Over the last two years, all certified peace officers in the state of Kentucky were mandated to receive training in the following areas. Ethical policing, legal review, don't knock warrants, early intervention systems, ethics, de-escalation techniques, use of force, restriction of chokeholds, understanding bias, and duty to intervene. All this training is in addition to the minimum mandatory 40 hours of required in-service training received each year. Most citizens that I speak to do not realize that constables have the same authority as a police officer. Not only can they pull you over without any training, but they can also arrest you without any training. This is quite shocking to most of the citizens that I speak to, and I'm always asked, why is this not changed? Liability is also a great concern. In Pulaski County, where I'm from, we had two constables who were convicted in federal court over civil rights violations, intent to distribute methamphetamine, and one attempt to murder an FBI agent. Now our county government is tied up in numerous lawsuits due to the actions of these two men, and neither of them were certified officers. Untrained constables can also be a liability for other law enforcement in our state. I have personally pulled up to a constable four to check on him and make sure he was okay. Unfortunately, he was struggling to try to figure out how to write a traffic citation. Uh, it was not necessarily his fault. He was trying to do a job that he was not trained to do. My officers have also responded to calls for assistance from constables. And once there, they had to correct or fix the situation that the constable, quite frankly, caused. This puts unnecessary liability on our police departments in this state. The days of handing someone a badge and a gun and just telling them to go police our community is long gone. We are not here today to ask for the position of constable uh, to be abolished, and quite honestly, it is unfair that the position we put constables in today without any training. I'm sure many of the constables uh, in our state and here in this room today are honorable men and women, but to ask them to do a job that they are not trained to do is just unfair. Today, we are asking that they be held to the same standard as other certified police officers if they wish to have full police powers as certified officers. We are respectfully asking today for equal training, for equal authority in our great commonwealth. Thank you for the service that you provide to our state. Thank you. And if we could have our guests uh, behind you the from the Constables Association make their way to the table, then we'll ask questions at the end. Sirs, if you could be quick here. We have a couple of questions already in the queue. So, Mr. McNabb and guests, thank you for being here. Thank you. If you could give your name and identify yourself and then the floor is yours. Got about maybe 
seven minutes or so, five, seven minutes. Uh, Wade McNabb, I'm the president of the Kentucky Constable Association. Shelby Lynn Toller, I'm the Professional Standards Government Affairs Committee Chair. William Elkins, Clark County Attorney. Okay, if you if you hit your microphone there, sir. William Elkins, Clark County Attorney. Still not on. All right, here we go. There you go. Now you're <laughs> William Elkins, Clark County Attorney. Okay, thank you for being here. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, my name is Wade McNabb. I'm the president of the Kentucky Constable Association, representing nearly 600 constables and deputy constables across the Commonwealth. I'm also the government affairs or government relations director for the National Constables and Marshals Association. I come before you today and ask you to oppose House Bill 239. First and foremost, House Bill 239 is unconstitutional. It attempts to strip a constitutionally elected peace officer of their peace officer powers unless they complete a 20-week training academy. The peace officer powers were embedded in the position of constable, same as sheriffs, jailers, and coroners, when the position was established in our Constitution in 1850. Although the duties of constable may be enumerated in the statutes, the peace officer powers are prescribed in the Constitution with the establishment of the office. House Bill 239 attempts to eliminate the inherent and constitutional powers and prerogatives of the Office of Constable. Our state Supreme Court, in the case of Johnson v. Commonwealth, recognized that the General Assembly may not statutorily abolish an office established by the Constitution, nor may it strip a constitutional office of so many duties that it becomes an empty shell. The Johnson Court went on to quote the previous case of Covington Bridge Commission v. City of Covington, which states that the legislature may not divest an office created by or named in the Constitution of its original and inherent functions. House Bill 239 divests constables of their original and inherent functions as peace officers. Putting aside the constitutional issue for a moment, Representative Koenig would like for you to believe that this bill is a, all about training. However, this bill isn't a training bill at all. It is a bill about eliminating the Office of Constable through attrition and turning it into an empty shell that our Supreme Court has determined to be unconstitutional. House Bill 239 only allows one constable in each DOCJT training class. As mentioned, there are only 9 to 10 training classes per year. With nearly 600 constables and deputy constables in Kentucky, it would take nearly 60 years to train everyone. In the meantime, constables that weren't able to get into class would be relegated to sitting back without peace officer powers to assist their communities. Within three to four election cycles, there would effectively be no office of constable. Many constables work other full-time positions to support their families and could not take off 20 weeks uh, to attend the academy. Other constables would simply not be able to complete the rigorous physical agility requirements to pass the academy due to their age or other conditions. This requirement would effectively discriminate against a class of potential candidates for the office due to their age or physical disabilities. Many constables in Kentucky depend Many counties in Kentucky depend heavily on their constables to supplement their law enforcement protection, with police and sheriff's departments all across the state suffering from dangerous short staffing issues. It's the constables that pick up the slack and fill the void where needed. I can testify to a personal example of how important constables are, especially in rural Kentucky. I was a police officer for a small department in northeastern Kentucky and found myself as the lone man on third shift with my near nearest backup being 20 minutes away. There were many occasions when I called for assistance at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and it was a constable that showed up to help me and I appreciated that assistance. We as constables are the first to say that we need training and we want training. We have POP certified constables who can't get the needed training at DOCJT to maintain their certification because they are told that they're simply not a priority. There are other constable training options currently filed in the House with House Bill 155. House Bill 155 establishes a constable training uh, certification program consisting of 88 hours in the areas of basic law enforcement skills, basic officer skills, constitutional law, penal code, and domestic violence. Once a constable completes the requisite training, he would be, become a certified constable. To maintain that certification, they would be required to complete a 40-hour in-service training annually, complete firearms qualification annually, and complete emergency vehicle operations training biannually. 
This is a great start to providing constables with the accredited and much needed training and can be built upon in the years to come to include other training requirements as needed. Training for all law enforcement officers is necessary, but House Bill 239 is not the answer for constables. Removing nearly 600 volunteer law enforcement officers from our county roadways in a time when law enforcement agencies all across the state are stretched beyond their capacities is not in the best interest of the citizens of Kentucky. That is why I ask you today to oppose House Bill 239 and protect our Constitution and protect the communities across the Commonwealth who have depended on their constables for the past 172 years. When each of us took the oath to take office, we swore to uphold the Constitution of this Commonwealth, and I ask you to uphold that Constitution today and vote no on the passage of House Bill 239. Yeah. To Brief comments from the others. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, thanks to the committee for having us. Um, I certainly have um, mountains of respect for each and every one of you. I want I want to talk to you uh, just real quickly. First of all, as I said, William Elks, Clark County Attorney, uh, bachelor's degree in Police Administration, Public Safety. I graduated from the Department of Criminal Justice Training in 1988. Spent 11 years in law enforcement myself before becoming an attorney and prosecuting thousands of bad guys. Uh, Clark County can't live without its constables. As it was uh, admitted here earlier, they're upstanding people, business people in our community. Uh, the difference is, is that a police officer hired to perform intense law enforcement responsibilities over a 20 to 25 year period uh, and a constable is that the police officer screened out of an application process. Investment is made in training. We know he's gonna be in an intense environment for 20 years. We recover those training dollars. He gets better and better all the time. Constable elected by his neighbors, his friends who love and trust him already. His responsibilities are not the same. We shouldn't think about him the same. It does law enforcement an injustice to put everybody in one barrel and say that sheriff's deputies, law enforcement, uh, varieties of all types, police officers, troopers, constables are all the same. They all have the same training. Training should relate to responsibilities. And in Clark County, Kentucky, uh, these fellows, uh, they serve process, roadside assistance, event control. They do some law enforcement response, and law enforcement response is dangerous. Uh, but they, they fill in their ranks uh, with quit or fired police officers. That's who you pop certified candidates are going to be. You pop certified candidate who quit or fired is the only one eligible to put his name on the ballot in 2023 if he wants to have arrest powers. That brings more danger to the community. Those people have been screened out of the process. You don't want to bring them back in uh, with full arrest power and no supervision. Um, you know, the, the, the cost of insuring liability should be a local issue. Let me tell you what we do in Clark County, Kentucky, because I think it's a model platform. We have a constable oversight board that has three members of the fiscal court on it, two members of the local constable association, and by executive uh, committee, they determine what the 150-page SOP of the Clark County Constable is going to be, and that SOP limits law enforcement activities with the use of blue lights and emergency equipment only to uh, non-emergency situations, power of arrest is needed, but if they're going to turn those lights on, race through that town, they've got to have a specific request from the highest ranking police officer on that 911 platform. No call jumping, no call taking. So I offer that to you to demonstrate just how local it is. You heard two examples of two bad guys. I could say the same thing about big city police officers, Lexington and Fayette County have each fired one for misconduct in the last year since I sat at this table with you last year telling you how great constables are, and then I can name six guys in Clark County, Kentucky that haven't done a thing. So don't take Clark County's constables away from Clark County in the name of fixing some issue that they have in Somerset. Leave our guys in place. May, let, let's pass this bill one more year. It's been 13 years. There's no reason why we can't talk about this one more time. And let's structure training relating to activities so that everybody can be safe. It's a win-win for everybody. We don't have 600 police officers to give up. I'm asking you, uh, okay. turn this bill down. Vote no. All right, gentlemen, your time is your time is up. We have uh, have a question from Senator Alvarado or comment. Well, just a comment. I think you've heard it from my own county attorney, Flynn Toller, who's a constable in Clark County. This is a big deal for us, and I've spoken out about about this bill in the past. Um, you know, this uh, I don't think our county attorney's office could function properly. This county attorney's taken us from 120th. Uh, in terms of child um, uh, kind of uh, collections for people that are deficient on their uh, child support 
uh, I think first in the state, partly, mainly because our constables are the ones who are serving those issues and doing those things. We've got a model situation in Clark County. Uh, I had just a, a quick blurb from somebody uh, in my district who sent me an email regarding this bill saying, um, uh, I have some of the best neighbors who are good people. Some criminals shoot at our mailboxes as targets, steal our tools, throw dangerous drugs and needles into the creeks where cattle drink. All of this virtually stopped after our local constables began driving around. He'd have zero effect if he wasn't allowed to be armed or have the resources necessary to protect the good people of our community. These folks are important in our rural communities. And I've got partly urban and rural, and I know there's a lot of discussions on this, but this for me is really personal. Uh, and this really will hamstring our guys, limit what they can do. We've got a model situation. They're dearly loved. Our landlord association loves these guys as well. Uh, and we really can't afford to have this done to them. I, I see this, you know, kind of a flyer where it puts these guys, make them look, I, we could do this with people that have served in the legislature, people that have served in, uh, as, as sheriffs, as, as, you know, people that have served in police departments all over the place. There's bad actors everywhere. Um, but, I mean, ultimately, again, there's systems where it's working great. And I'm going to encourage members to vote no on this. I, I just think it's a bad idea. And it's going to hurt, hurt a lot of small communities that rely on our constables who do a great job. Okay, prior to Senator Alvarado's comments, we had a motion from Senator McGarvey, second from Senator Thayer. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. S Senator Alvarado? No. Senator Harper Angel? Aye. Senator McDaniel? Aye. Senator McGarvey? Explain my aye vote, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you may. I vote aye, County Attorney Elkins. They only target one county when it's Jefferson, the statewide bill. Thank you. Senator Nemes? No. Senator Schroeder. Mr. Chair, explain my vote. Yes, you may. Thank you. I vote aye uh, today as well. We just want to address some of the comments. Um, you know, I do not think it strips. I think clearly the language uh, keeps the office constable, takes away the arrest powers. I think that is reasonable. You know, we heard constables are outstanding people. And I believe most in Kentucky are, but unfortunately, we do have a number of examples, not just two. We could go on and on. And I think the difference between bad actors who are constables and bad actors in the General Assembly or anywhere else, the other bad actors we're talking about don't have arrest powers. And when we look at arrest powers, that's a very serious thing. We're talking about our neighbors, our family members. And when I know a police officer that has gone through the academy, has gone through training, I don't have to worry about a bad situation occurring when uh, they arrest someone. But we know that there have been incidents with constables have arrested people. Um, just one other thought I had, Mr. Chair. Oh, to address, you know, the fact that constables are on for office and are elected. Well, I agree with that. And you oftentimes hope that the election process weeds out the bad apples, but we have situations in my county being one of them where there was a chance that a constable who had previously been a felon who was pardoned was going to run on the post until someone else was encouraged to run against him. So you clearly have situations where bad actors are being elected, not because their neighbors are saying these are good people, but because no one else is even stepping up. So for these reasons, I vote aye. Senator Southworth. Explain my no vote, Mr. Chairman. Yes, you may. Mr. Chairman, um, the Constitution doesn't require sheriffs to have POP certification. We don't require special deputies to have POP certification. And um, we shouldn't be requiring constables to have POP certification. Um, and, and to speak to the political campaign style scam ads that come to our desks here. It's totally embarrassing. Uh, I have actually seen this number of people just in my county alone in the paper, unfortunately, but it seems like every time I turn around, we've got another one of our uh, sometimes elected, but usually sheriff deputy or somebody like that um, doing something. And it's not just my county. My county is not hitting the national news. We've got places like Bardstown. I mean, they're city police. People are scared to walk in there, they're going to get shot. Somebody else is going to get killed. There's all kinds of terrible stuff going on, and that's got nothing to do with this issue. So I find it entirely wrong to pit the Constitution against bad headlines and 
the most important thing here is the lack of police force that we already have. I don't see how we're going to fill that gap. There's just no earthly way we're going to fill that gap when we get rid of, by attrition, I like that word, it explains this bill 100%, of these guys sitting right here. And this is an urban versus rural issue because the rural communities depend more than the urbans, but frankly, one of the best departments I've seen is from Fayette County. They're really organized. So it, it doesn't have to be rural versus urban. I think we need to stand up for our law enforcement. I thought that bodies like ours were the people who did stand up for our law enforcement. I'm standing up for our law enforcement today and voting no. That was a no. No. <laughs> Senator Storm. Aye. Senator Thayer. Aye. Senator Wheeler. Aye. Senator Mills. I vote aye. And House Bill five or sorry, 293 or 239 passes uh, with favorable expression eight to three. And it will move forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, we have uh, extremely tight schedules here. Uh, I'm going to make an executive decision. We have we'll have another special meeting. I'm going to roll these final bills. I apologize for folks that have waited here. Uh, just so you know, we we have three House committees that roll into this one committee. And this, if if you want to keep this from happening again, House members need to file bills earlier. We have so many bills coming at us so we will have another special call meeting to handle uh these items uh yeah yeah and, and i and senator thayer will give these four bills readings on the floor so it will not uh inhibit uh these moving forward but thank you so much and i apologize again for if you've stayed in here for the last hour but uh we are adjourned thank you